Uh, Welcome oh. to the recording. Yeah. All right. This is uh, we're we haven't done this in a while. Yeah. I'd like to say it's all Tommy's fault. But it's not. Is the thing. It's actually not it's, my fault. It's mostly Tommy's fault because you went out of town. Well, okay, yeah, that actually is true. Yeah, I forgot about that one. Oh, wow, whoa, wow, <laughs> the whole week, a, man. Wow. Am I going to have to do a cold opening for this episode? Sure, why not? Crazy, wow. <laughs> All right. Um, on today's episode, Disqualified, we look at a very special team. It's a team that tried to use a chassis that failed its initial crash test to sell an engine that didn't work. It's the <laughs> ill-fated tale of first and life here on Disqualified. First uh, life. Yeah, I'm... <laughs> I'm your host, Matthew, here with Davey and Tommy. As always, we're back after a hot minute. How you guys doing today? I'm Davey. It's me. I'm doing great. I'm doing great. Should we? Should we? Oh, I have an Okay, so real quick idea. Let's get. Let's start the show off on a, on okay. a little ruse. Right. Joe just asked if we're podcasting right now. Should we say no and have him hop in? Special guest for like a minute. <laughs> sure. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> this is bad. Uh, we'll cut it out. You won't even know what happened. You wouldn't. You, they'll never hear it. <laughs> Does that mean Are I can sing? Four-man episode of Disqualified? Four-man episode. Joe's definitely four, not sticking four, around. Four no dudes way. on the grid. Yeah. Four. Hey, oh, it's pre-qualifying. You gotta get a pre-qualifying. Yeah. Hey, Joe. Hey, Joe. Hey, Joe. You are... You're officially on Disqualified now. <laughs> oh. <laughs> <laughs> How do you, how do you feel? Am, I, do you feel? am I screwing your stuff up? No. <laughs> okay. No, 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 no. Absolutely not. Is this... All right, I think I should go then. <laughs> okay. <laughs> see you, Joe. All Thanks right. for coming around. Yeah. I'm glad you guys let me stop in and see what you actually do <laughs> when you do it or something. I'll tell. I'll, I'll make sure to let the boss know. All right. Okay. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Tell Bristol. All right, all see, you, see you, Joe. Congrats don't, on don't, being a member of Disqualified. <laughs> he hated that. He hated it so much. He's so upset. <clears throat> He's so mad. Yeah. All right. Life in first step one. First yeah. in life. Oh, so, man. Uh, by the way, Tommy, you didn't introduce yourself. but Oh, yeah. My yeah, name is Tommy so. Bordeaux, 1948 right. mini golf world champion. Don't ask where <laughs> it was on the day of December 7th, 1942. All right. Well, um, wow. I'm just going to okay. go past that. Um, speaking of the past though we return to the late 80s it's been a very popular destination for the show and probably still will be as the impending ban on turbo engines has the f1 grid swelling and these new teams beaming with optimism uh, many teams would take this opportunity to jump from junior formulas to f1 one of which being lamberto leone's first racing team uh, not the first ever racing team um that was just the name although i do believe they were his first racing team so uh, well that's good yeah Imagine if you made another one. It's a good brand. Second race. It's a good brand synergy there. Um, Leone, born in Argenta, Italy in 1953, was a racing driver of his own right, competing in F2 throughout the 70s, um, the highlight of which was a win at Misano in 1977, the same year that saw Leone make his F1 debut, a DNQ at his home Grand Prix at Monza for Team Surtees. Um, the following year saw him start the season driving for Ensign, reti uh, retiring in Argentina and failing to start in Brazil. He failed to qualify for the next two races in South Africa and Long Beach, which led him to lead the team after just four appearances. And unfortunately, that would be it for him in F1 as a driver. Um, he would return to F2 for the next year, driving for himself. Um, and these two appearances were largely fruitless, and it would be another three years before Leone would be back in an F2 car, where he returned with fellow F1 refugee Arturo Mazzario's team. Um, this kick-started two years of sporadic appearances in F2, with his only points finish being a sixth at Silverstone at the 83 season opener, before the Formula 2 series was ended after 1984. <clears throat> Formula 3000 would then take over as the main feature series to F1 in 85, and with it, Leone scored two podiums at Poe and the Osterreich Ring. Um, after attempting the first eight races of 1986, Leone left the ITI 3000 team he'd been running for to form his own team for 1987 first racing. Uh, Leone would be the driver of one of his three cars for their inaugural season, uh, where he scored three-fourths, a fifth, and a sixth, scoring 12 points, and finished ninth in the standings. 
um, the best finish of his career. The team's other full-time driver, Gabriele Tarquini, who I believe we've sh- we've covered on the show, and if we haven't, we definitely will talk about him at some point. I think we've mentioned yeah, we- him, but I know yeah. I know the name anyway. So it's I believe he drove for Coloni, if I'm if I'm not mistaken. I believe you're right. Yeah, um, he scored a second, a third, and a fifth, and also scored 12 points and finished ahead of Leone in eighth via tiebreakers. Um, and then their third car would be shared between Italian drivers Aldo Bertuzzi, Beppe Gaviani, and fellow or former friend of the show Claudio Langes. <laughs> a lot um, of um, as... a lot of Italians. <laughs> yeah, uh, this will also not be the first time or the only time that we mention uh, Claudio in this episode. Um, there would also be a one-off appearance by French driver Alain Ferta. Uh, following a solid year one for the team, Tarquini was off to drive for Coloni. I forgot I put it in the script. Uh, there you go. <laughs> Way to go. Leone retired from open wheel racing. <laughs> um, in came longtime Minardi F1 driver Pierre Luigi Martina and or Martini and future F1 record holder Marco <laughs> Apicello. That, 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 that record's the, uh, that's the shortest the, that's... Grand Prix career of all time. Yes, yep. <laughs> I like that one. That's my favorite one. I it, It's like what you mentioned a couple episodes ago. I love how much crossover there is, like how many drivers just appear in these different stories yeah i uh, tommy really brought th- brought up a good point there so many italians yeah what's up with italians? italians why, the, why what is, mama mia so many times what is the racing renaissance that happened in like the 70s and 60s with italians dude the yeah. late 80s and and into the mid 90s there was just a massive swath of italian pay drivers or just italian drivers who just made it into f1 like there That's are so, so many italian drivers from that era davy we gotta we gotta we gotta switch our geographic locations. It yeah, would, it would appear. <laughs> Time to move Italy. Yes, yeah, sir. Uh, bonjour. Yeah. Uh, hey, yo, we. Hey, hey. <laughs> uh, I was gonna say you went kind of French there for a second. So I could pass with my last. Well, no, maybe not in Italy, but yeah, no. I was about to say. <laughs> oh. there, no, there was no a decent shot. amount of French drivers too during that era. So you yeah, there you go. Like, so. Something in the has, water, man. Something I'm in sure, the water. I'm thinking yeah. Hazard is it Italian? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I don't Hazardi. Know. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> yeah! Anyway. Yeah, yeah Hazardi. There you go. <laughs> anyway, go. Pierre Luigi Martini scored first. Well, first when at Purdue. <laughs> scored first, first, first at Perdusa, as well as three other podiums to finish fourth in the championship, while Apicella scored a second and two other points finishes to come home 11th. Uh, Martini returned to Minardi in F1 for 89, having run the last two thirds of the season for the Italian team. Um, the team, though, initially planned to follow Martini to F1, but things wouldn't go as planned for the team. So, seems, Mar- to, be the, seems to be the thing. Yeah. Don't the <laughs> I don't know so, if you guys noticed. Yeah. Kind of a running theme on this show. Dare I say, <laughs> the entire concept of it. Um. <laughs> While Martini and Apicella were running in F3 or F3000 for first, Leone had been in contact with Richard Davila, a former designer for the Copper Sukar team, which was owned by the Fittipaldi brothers. Um, and they, he was commissioning him to design a car for first to enter into F1 in 1989 because of the turbo ban. The team it had a deal in place for Pirelli tires and Judd engines, as you know, as we've covered before, kind yep. of obligatory. The, the standard. Yeah. And uh, 1989, as we've discussed, would be the entry point for many junior formula teams to move up. Davila's plans, or original plans for the car, were based around the March F3000 chassis that first had been running. However, Davila had plans to move to the Ligier team in 1989, so the manufacturing of Davila's design had to be overseen by someone else. The March chassis wasn't seen as a suitable basis for the design, so Leone subcontracted a design studio in Milan, run by former Ferrari and Zax, or run by a former Ferrari and Zach Speed engineer, who I unfortunately couldn't find the name of. Um, however, during the manufacturing process, the carbon fiber tub was cooked in the autoclave at the wrong temperature, leading to the chassis essentially being overcooked. Um, the team would show up to the Attilio. Bat- I'm not even going to a memorial event at the Bologna uh, motor event. I'm not going to attempt to pronounce that. Um, and the Formula One indoor trophy um, where Davila basically saw his design in person for the first time. And he was horrified by the results. The mounting points for the suspension and the gearbox were reportedly especially badly made. 
um, and the entire chassis was lacking rigidity. Uh, Davila described the car as being nothing more than, quote, an interesting flower pot, oh and God. urged the team and any prospective drivers from stepping into it, even oh going God. as far even going as far to pursue legal action to have his name removed as designer of the chassis. Jesus mercy. Um, for, oh my you, God. for you film fans out there, he was basically trying to put the designer as Alan Smith because he did not want to be credited with it. Um, <laughs> Gabriele Tarquini drove the car in the two events at the Bologna Motor Show and had been slated to drive for the team in 1989 and they were soundly beaten by good friend Pierluigi Martini's Martin, er, Menard. So... It, uh, the the Formula One indoor thing was like it was similar to like the race of champions, how they would do like a bracket of head to head races, and like a bunch of backmarker teams would all show up for it. That's so, cool. Nah. I had, like, like that. I didn't know that was even a that's thing. Kinda, I think Coloni went to one. At this one, I think it was Coloni, Minardi, Life, and I think one other team were the four teams that were there. What? That's yeah, ridiculous. it was just like all backmarkers. That's fine. <laughs> um, oh my god. To add on to this, though, uh, the car failed its initial FIA-mandated crash test, proving Davila right. Uh, Leone, desperate to save his F1 program from death before it even started, had to commission a second chassis that, that would be properly made. This, however, would cause the team to miss the first two events of the F1 calendar, which would result in massive fines by the FIA. In the meantime, Leone had engineers inject the weak points of the chassis with a material called Redis 410NA to try to salvage the first chassis. <laughs> so they've gotten to the point where they're just like injecting random stuff into weak parts of the car, hoping it'll make it stronger and safer. Oh my god! Um, behind the curtain, uh, we do this stuff in FSE all the time. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so. My god! Yep. Um, the car passed its second test with said injections, but now the car was tremendously overweight. This left Leone in a tough spot as his choices were to miss the first two races and face massive financial consequences or attempt to qualify for the first two races with a hopelessly uncompetitive car in what would be a fording car field and face massive financial consequences. Um, before the season opening Grand Prix, though, or Brazilian Grand Prix, Leone chose neither, instead opting to pull his entry from the F1 paddock and focusing his effort back on his F3000 <laughs> program instead. So that's why when we talked about the 89 season previously, we said a 39 car field and not a 40 car field because first didn't make it. <laughs> I so. like how it's like, do you want to pay a bunch of money or do you want to pay a bunch of money? Yeah. And the guy was just like, no. <laughs> no. <laughs> do you want to spend no. all your money on travel expenses or fines? No, thanks. <laughs> he was like, I'd rather just go back to F3000. <laughs> so. Fair enough. So that was the only time first would ever attempt to make it to F1, but that would not be the end of that chassis so oh God, as why? it perhaps should have been <laughs> <laughs> as it perhaps should have been yeah Very around the same on. time a man named ernesto vita an italian businessman was trying to sell an innovative idea to the f1 paddock the new engine regulations had opened up a world of possibilities for engine layouts in f1 uh, a swath of new manufacturers were ending f1 most designing v8s Ferrari and Lamborghini had built V12s, while Renault and Honda had split the difference and gone for V10s. Only one engine builder, the collaborative effort between Motori Moderni and Subaru, had built anything outside the V layout with their ill-fated flat 12 that we previously covered in the Colony episode. Ferrari had previously run flat 12s in the 70s, but those had gone to the wayside with the advent of ground effects. Franco Aracci, who had designed Ferrari's F1 engines until his retirement in 1974, had been dreaming of a new engine layout. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, oh my god, I lost my spot. His idea was a W engine, or a or what was called a broad arrow engine, which featured three banks of cylinders instead of the traditional two. Um, his design would feature the two angled banks normally seen in traditional V engines, but also had a third vertical bank in between. Um... W engines had been used in aircraft in the 1920s, but were phased out due to their lack of performance. Rachi had built a prototype <laughs> W3 ah. engine to serve as a test bed for his passion project, a W18 engine for Ferrari's F1 program at the time. I gotta, hold on. Yeah. <laughs> I'll save your spot just in case. Yeah. My favorite part about some of these is I love when it's like, this guy had a great idea that he wanted to sell to someone. And it's like, here's the idea. Here's why they don't use this idea anymore 20 yep. years later. Here's another example of the idea where the idea was 
horribly outdated and, and, and already like a bad idea 60 years ago. But this guy wants to do it anyway. I love that. I, I love that so much. And he, it must work. I, 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 that's insane. It, almost all of them start out with, so he wants to do this. Those things are haven't been competitive in 30 years. But he still wants to do it. I just don't get it. It's awesome. Yeah. It didn't work <laughs> in plane engines in the 20s. <laughs> it's it's like you know it's like that scene from this is where you're putting the scene well, from arrested, a car. arrested development where it's like you know oh it never works for them but it might work for us <laughs> yeah. they're like why has nobody ever built a w engine and it's like because they don't work and he was like all right but hear me out <laughs> we build a w18 even Here's more moving parts make it even more complicated <laughs> and truly it will work <laughs> so um Oh, Needless to say, gosh. the W18 engine was never built and proved to be far too massive and complicated. Um, Rachi would lose or would leave Ferrari uh, in the mid 70s and would continue working on his passion project, a W12 instead, scaling the engine down vastly. Um, but he did this all in private. It wasn't like a thing where there was a ton of hype around it. He was just like a retired dude designing engines. So <laughs> I found sick. I'll be honest with you. Yeah, <laughs> that's awesome. <laughs> In theory, the engine idea has merit. It would have the power of a V12, but be the length of a V8, with the only downside seemingly being a taller engine than normal. However, this idea had no place in F1, as it was all about small turbo-powered engines throughout the 80s when he was developing it. That all changed in 1989, though, with the banning of turbo engines, with, with top teams like Lotus and Williams either losing their engine deal or being forced to run uncompetitive, naturally aspirated engines in 88, there seemingly was a market for Rachi's engine design. There was one problem, though. He couldn't afford to actually build it. He would have to find someone to bring his dream to life, and that man was the aforementioned Ernesto Vita. While I'm unable to find what Vita did before F1 to make his money, he saw a massive opportunity to make a lot of more of it. A lot of more of it. Oh my god, I turned Italian there for a second. He made a lot of more mm -hmm. of it uh, quickly with Rachi's engine design. <laughs> He bought the plans from Ranchi and put together teams in Reggio Emilia and Formagine to build the W12. Dubbing his company Life, which was the English translation of his last name, Ernesto Vida began shopping his engine design around to F1 teams in 1989. However, nobody was interested. <laughs> the engine was completely untested and nobody wanted to take the risk. Teams like Zack Speed and Colony would take on experimental engines design or experimental engine. Blah, oh my god, I cannot talk tonight. Zack Speed and Colony would take on experimental engine designs by established makers in Yamaha and Subaru that year, and both would go horrendously badly. So, needless to say, nobody wanted to shell out millions of dollars for an engine design that had never been used in a race car by a company that they had never heard of. <laughs> So, spurned on by his lack of interest, Vita decided he didn't need to sell his engine to an existing team, but instead he would make his own team to show the paddock what they were missing out on. Yeah! And I can kind of tell that you guys know where this is going. I love it. I love it. I'm all about that. That's the kind of energy and attitude I'm trying to bring to like everything. Oh my god. Yeah. I love it. Nobody wants to buy our engine? Let's just make our own car and show how good yeah. our engine is. Listen, you give that guy a, an endless budget, I bet he makes some great decisions. But I bet. wow. Yeah. That's wow. awesome. Yeah. That is so, amazing. Being a brand new team, life had a lot of work to do if they were going to go F1 racing. Keep in mind, this isn't... <laughs> this is... A, a team run by somebody who's never had any s sort of affiliation with motor racing as far as I can tell they have no junior formula experience like the previous three teams that we've talked about um, all they have right now is an engine or at least the plans for an engine Vita regrouped the team in their facilities in for, uh, Formagine and built the Lone Life W12 engine Lacking the facilities to build a chassis, Vita went shopping for a chassis and found none other than Lamberto Leone's first program. Oh, now goodness. I'm not able to confirm which chassis Vita bought because I've read reports that says that he bought the second chassis that had been commissioned. Um, but the existence of a second chassis would make first decision to pull out of the 89 season make a lot less sense. But I've also read that the second chassis was never finished which would mean that vita had to buy <laughs> the first one 
Now, <laughs> based on the way things go in this story, I'm more inclined to believe the second chassis was never built because the second chassis has never turned up. So right, right. either either the first one got completely scrapped and destroyed, which doesn't usually happen. Chassis usually get repurposed or the second one never got built. But all we know is there was only ever one first or uh, F-189. So, <laughs> so I'm willing to believe that the one that uh, that Ernesto Vito bought was the first one. So. That is even better. I'm yeah. glad. I'm also <laughs> glad it's that one. So, much to Richard Davila's chagrin, Vita bought the stillborn first chassis and spent 1989 fitting his new W12 engine into it. Um, the already flimsy <laughs> chassis had been designed for a Judd V8, so Gianni Morelli, another former Ferrari engineer, had his work cut out for him to make the car accept the hulking W12. Once finished, the massive size of the engine was very apparent as the once sleek chassis design now had a massive bulge at the rear for the W12. Alongside the airbox, the car also had two more air intakes besides the driver's shoulders, and the cockpit sides and side pods were now even lower to accommodate them. So they basically took an unsafe car and made it even more unsafe. <laughs> So, despite a near full year of time to develop it, life only ever had one engine and chassis, so spare parts would always be a rarity. For 1990, Life signed F1 legend Sir Jack Brabham's son, Gary Brabham, to drive the newly renamed Life L190. Richard Davila was now even more horrified as his original creation had been badly butchered into a car that was massively overweight and even more unsafe. <laughs> The engine was theoretically able to push out 400 horsepower, but reliability issues oh immediately God. showed that this would not be sustainable. <laughs> oh so the engine God. had to be detuned to push out 375. Um, to put that in perspective, the leading cars on the grid were pushing 700 horsepower. And to make matters worse, F3000 cars of that era could manage 450. So they would be off pace in an F3 race more than likely. <laughs> um... <laughs> I cannot wait oh. until we get to the season proper. You guys are going to lose your minds. Uh, oh. Davila warned Brabham that the engine could push the car to a mind-boggling 135 miles per hour, <laughs> which, not fast at all by F1 standards, but for a car that poorly built, could still be very dangerous. Oh my god. Um, the season opening Phoenix Grand Prix came around, and in the nine-car pre-qualifying, Brabham turned in a 207.147, 35.8 seconds off Roberto Moreno's Euro run at the top of the chart. Um, hilariously, oh. he wasn't the slowest, <laughs> as that was the race that Bertrand Gascio had his car stuck in <laughs> one gear and was three minutes slower. <laughs> so, not already starting off good. They're already faster than Colonia. So, uh, the following race wow. in Brazil, Brabham didn't even set a lap time in pre qualifying as his engine broke a connecting rod just 400 meters out of pit road. The story goes that the team's crew members were apparently already fed up with Vita, <laughs> and the mechanics revealed that they were on strike and didn't put any oil in the engine, causing it to fail oh nearly god. immediately. Oh my god! <laughs> Jesus Christ. Oh uh, this god. would be the final straw, as Brabham would leave the team after just two races, saying that the team was so unprepared that the car's tachometer never worked, and the team didn't even have a tire pressure gauge, instead being forced to borrow one from Eurobrun. Oh. <laughs> they couldn't they had some friends even, in the paddock? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> they couldn't even check their tire pressures. So there was more than likely... Uh, a point during practice where Brabham was like, what are our tire pressures? And one of the mechanics said, not flat. So. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's a I good mean, step want, in the right direction. Hey, listen, listen. They could be flat. Yeah, they, they've got air in them. Could have been flat. <laughs> what oh what pressures are we running? Who's to say? <laughs> it, to be fair, it wasn't really their biggest problem. Yeah. So, they, I mean, <laughs> You know, yeah. Maybe you should ask the car had oil in it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, just when, maybe. When he was sitting on the side of the the track, you know, the engine having already grenaded 400 meters out of pit road, and he was like, oh, "We should check tire pressures." <laughs> <laughs> um, Brabham had also attempted to persuade Vita into switching to a Judd engine, like the chassis had been designed for, but seeing as the team was little more than a vanity project for the W12 engine, this fell on deaf ears. 
Um, Gianni Morelli, the man in charge of modifying the chassis to accept the W12, left as well because of this. Vita tried courting Bernd Schneider to take over driving duties, but the German denied, saying, quote, I definitely don't want to drive for them. <laughs> <laughs> Schneider had just spent 1989 driving for Zack Speed with an equally hopeless experimental Yamaha engine, so you can kind of understand his, uh, his reluctance. <laughs> the team then considered their test driver, Franco Scapini, for the seat, but Scapini had not received his super license. Seemingly one of the only people interested was New Zealand driver Rob Wilson, who expressed interest, especially if they brought out a second car. Um, also, a weird tidbit I found when I was researching this episode is Rob Wilson made a few Bush series starts for Joe Bessie in the 90s. What? So, <laughs> okay. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah. Oh and God. I think he made a few IndyCar starts, too. Yeah. Wow. Um. Unfortunately, though, the team hadn't been able to afford the second chassis, probably because it wasn't ever built, uh, or an engine. So, after two DNPQs, the finances weren't getting any better. Um, eventually, the team settled on Bruno Giacomelli. Bruno had previously raced for McLaren and Alfa Romeo in Formula One in the late 70s and early 80s, including a podium at the 1981 Caesar Spouse Grand Prix. Yeah! Let's go! <laughs> Um, after a final season with Tolman in 83, Giacomelli spent two years running sporadically on cart, including a DNQ at the Indy 500 in, I believe, 85, before spending the last half of the 80s running sports cars. He then was Leighton House's test driver in 88 and 89 before being plucked out of semi retirement by life. Good for him. So, maybe. To make thing, yeah, I mean, Bruno Giacomelli was a solid driver in his own right, but he hasn't raced an F1 car in seven years. Mm. So. It's he's not of... really going back to racing F1 cars. It, no, it, yeah, no. it would be like getting eight. It'd be like if when when Haas had their falling out with Nikita Mazepin and they were like, "We've signed Adrian Sutil." So. Oh yeah! Ouch. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, Giacomelli's first race with the team was the San Marino Grand Prix. Uh, for the second time in three races, life wasn't the slowest car in pre-qualifying. Um, HES had nice. brought a brand new chassis to Imola, and Gabriele Tarquini's fuel system failed on its first lap. Uh, and Yannick Dalmas withdrew from the event with a hand injury from the testing act or from a testing accident, so both cars failed to set a lap time. But still, seventh out of nine. Uh, Bruno would use this lucky break to turn in an absolutely legendary lap of seven minutes, sixteen point two one two seconds. Five minutes and 49 seconds off of Eric Bernard's LaRousse at the top of the pre-qualifying charts. Wow. <laughs> uh-huh. Those uh, are certainly numbers. That's yeah. a lap. That's a lap, man. Uh, Bruno suffered a... a... Oh, Bruno man. suffered a drive belt failure on his first slow lap, and the team wasn't able to fix it to set another lap time. Uh, Giacomelli was quoted as saying he was, quote, scared he might be struck from behind because of how slow <laughs> the L190 was. I had to double check, yeah. make sure they weren't at the Nordschleife. Yeah. Like, what? <laughs> the lap time was like a minute 20, and he said a seven minute lap time. <laughs> so. <laughs> Doesn't get much better than that, baby. Yeah. It's, I mean, it seemingly can't get worse than that. What so. would the average speed be on that? Uh, Probably like 100. No, actually, if probably even. like. It's camp 30. I think I read that it was like 35 miles per hour. Yeah, cruising. <laughs> 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 so, Monaco would see life in uncharted territory, though, as Giacomelli was able to complete seven laps without any mechanical issues before running, returning to the pits in one piece. That's huge. Um, I bet they yeah. felt great after that. <laughs> I would have been progress. thrilled. <laughs> They're like, dude, it made it back, not on a truck. Um, the team prepared the car to go make another run of pre qualifying, but the W12 then failed after just a lap. Uh, <laughs> there we go. There we go. So seven minutes. That's the we've we've discovered that or seven laps. We can go further, no further than that. Um, Giacomelli claw, uh, clocked in at a one forty one point one eight seven, only two seconds off Bertrand Gasho's Subaru powered Coloni, but he was a whopping fourteen seconds off Eric Bernard at the top of the chart. Jesus, good lord, at Monaco. Yep, yep. at Monaco. <laughs> Um, next up was Montreal, notoriously a power circuit, so which would fit the W12, I'm sure. Uh, Giacomelli again managed to complete seven laps in pre-qualifying, and again, the f engine failed immediately afterwards. <laughs> Giacomelli's time of a 150.2 excuse me, of a 
0.253 seconds was three seconds off Claudio Lange's Euro Brown and was 21.985 seconds behind Lange's teammate Roberto Moreno and the other Euro Brown. Uh, just five races in and reportedly the team had taken Brabham's advice and began talking to, to the Brabham team and Lotus <laughs> to buy some used Judd engines. Um, they're giving in. Yeah. I, I don't like it anymore. Five races in and they're already giving up on the vanity project. So, uh, damn. The, the Mexican Grand Prix saw Giacomelli turn in a blistering lap of four minutes, 7.475 seconds which was a mammoth two minutes, 42.194 seconds off of Olivier Grouillard's Osella at the top. Uh, wow. New manager Sergio Barbazio later confirmed the rumors that the team was planning to ditch the W12 engine and were working towards converting the engine, uh, the, uh, converting the chassis to accept <clears throat> the Judd engines they bought from Lotus. Uh, France would see the team fail to set a lap time for the second time as the car's engine failed on Giacomelli's outlap, leaving them last again. <laughs> wow uh they uh uh-huh every time i see that new team manager sergio barrazio later confirmed the rumors like are rumors swirling about these are, 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 were there people like us back then who were just oh, obsessed God. with these terrible f1 teams rumors were swirling about the life f1 or the the yeah the life f1 teams what? new engine whoa it's like they're they're seven sec they're seven minutes off the pace i don't like Who's who's like? What if one's getting the Judd? What? Like, no, I would I'd be all about that. I think I it's so cool. No, but it, I, I I you know I think we 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 miss that in in today's F one team. I know they're 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 pretty close on time. All right, and that's the thing. I, I get it. There's good teams. There's bad teams. But the bad teams aren't really that bad. I need bad teams. I want teams <laughs> to be like a minute off the pace. We want we need that. I can't tell you how perpetually upset I am that Stefan Grand or yeah, Stefan Grand Prix never made it to the grid because Stefan Grand Prix was a team was this dude who <clears throat> like every six years was like, I'm entering F1 and the FIA was like, no, you're not. <laughs> and in, in 2010, Toyota literally rented him their unraced chassis they had built for 2010. And he took them and like an entire team hospitality set up to the Bahrain Grand Prix and the FIA said no. And I was like, That's please, so I need to see his cars on the grid. I'm pretty sure he has Jacques Villeneuve signed as a driver. Too. Oh my god. So, he have Jacques Villeneuve come back. That's so lame. So, <laughs> I need a truly incompetent team on the grid again. So, god. Silverstone was the site of the British Grand Prix as always, and with it saw life's best performance yet. Uh, Jacques Amelie's time of 125.947 seconds was only 15.6 seconds off the leading LaRousse and just 7 seconds off of Gasho and the Colony. Uh, despite the alleged purchase of Judd engines, Barbazio told the media that the team had decided to stick with their in-house W12 engine with the lack of time to convert the chassis to accept the Judd engines as the reason, despite the chassis originally being designed for Judd engines <laughs> before life converted it. Um, however, Italian sources told Motor News newspaper that the deal with Lotus to purchase said engines had fallen through because of a lack of funds. So that makes a little more sense. Yeah, that one makes a little more sense. <laughs> Got to be honest. Yeah, we, we we had more trouble undoing the way we screwed up this chassis even worse. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> The F1 Circus moved on to the German Grand Prix at Hockenheim, and you can probably guess where this is going. <laughs> Jacques Valli ran a 210-786, 25 seconds off Philippe Elio's leading Ligier, and 20 seconds off of Lange's Eurobra. Um, reportedly, the car was around 40 miles per hour slower than the next closest car through the speed traps. Yeah. Um... <laughs> That's dangerous. Yeah. Uh, no surprise, they were going to struggle at Hockenheim. <laughs> the place that was literally just two straightaways with a hairpin. Yeah. So. <laughs> uh, luckily, though, the Hungaro ring, the next round, uh, in theory would minimize the deficit the hopeless W12 had put them at, but the chassis was so overweight that it didn't really matter, with Giacomelli running a 141.431, just shy of 20 seconds off of Nicola Larini's Ligier, and 15 seconds behind the next closest time, once again, Claudio Lange's in the Euro run. Oh my god. This is miserable. It is 
It is hilarious to think about because as we covered on the Eurobrand episode, like that season was hopeless for them and Lange's was terrible, but they're like, <laughs> it, every time Lange's like, at least I'm not those guys over there. Yeah. <laughs> That's sensational. That's terrific. Yeah. <laughs> no, dude. I could... The morale... Like... Just the, the 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 lack of morale actually that must be flowing. Dude, I could not imagine showing up to F1 weekends consistently at least thirty seconds off the pace. <laughs> yeah. And to keep I, doing it too. Like race to keep it was doing. obvious. It's not going to get better. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I'm saying. Like it's just there's there's no hope. There's never been a glimmer of hope. Yeah, I don't I mean what I don't know. No changes are being made, it doesn't seem. I mean, it doesn't seem like we're taking yeah, off the airbox or something. Yeah, they just showing up. Yeah, they just, just, just kind of doing it. I don't get it. Like, take the air cover off, man. Right. Do something. That's right. <laughs> or, the, or the engine covers. Excuse me. <laughs> uh, wow. By the way, the car only managed five laps until the engine failed. Of course it That's did. That's two. You go all the way out have there. One engine, and so they just keep rebuilding the same engine over and over God. and over again. <laughs> <laughs> like, man, I wonder if this one will last more than seven laps. <laughs> the same one. Yeah. <laughs> Oh my god. By the I Belgian just, Grand Prix. Oh, go ahead. Sorry. Yeah. No, go ahead. By the Belgian Grand Prix, the Onyx team had fallen apart and failed to show up, so Giacomelli only had to find a way to beat three other cars to make it through pre qualifying. Ah! <laughs> <laughs> but the life was still hopelessly slow, setting a best time of 2 minutes 19.445 seconds, 21 and a half seconds off the leading Ocella of Grillyard, and 18 seconds behind Claudio Langes. Um, and again, the car managed to just five laps, but this time it's due to an electrical failure, not the engine. Oh, um, good. But Giacomelli was quoted as describing the car's performance as, quote, nothing impressive. <laughs> yeah, nice way to put it. <laughs> uh, He's it's correct. A, it's, yeah, it is a, it's a nice way to put it. Um, Bruno also told reporters that the team had begun working again to fit a Judd V8, having finally acquired an engine to replace the hopeless W12, with their target date being the Portuguese Grand Prix, leaving just one more race for the Life W12 to redeem itself. Yeah. Fittingly, the W12 engine's final race would be its home Grand Prix, the Italian Grand Prix at Monza. <laughs> yeah! Uh, debatedly, the most famous power circuit in the world. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe finally, the theoretical power benefits of the W12 could be recognized on its home soil. Um, unfortunately, Giacomelli managed just two laps before the engine suffered one more final spectacular failure leaving life with a time of just 1 minute 55.244 seconds, 28 seconds off Grillyard's leading time, and 20 seconds behind Lange's Euro run. And with that, a W12 engine has never appeared in an F1 race again. Um, wow. Yeah. Wow. Now, the W12 had been an absolute failure, which was especially embarrassing considering the team was established to sell the engine to other teams. But with the switch to jet engines, life were now just a low budget team running a customer chassis, which had already been deemed too slow and overweight and unsafe for F1. <laughs> but now they had the engine that the car was designed for. And considering Europe run were also running jet engines, they had a direct measuring stick and Roberto Moreno and Claudio Langes for performance of the car. Surely the race at Estoril would show improvement for the team. Um, taking just 10 days to modify, the car was now a massive 175 pounds lighter um, and Davey, it's funny you mentioned removing the airbox or engine cover because they only oh had one god. and it didn't fit because it was designed for the W12. Oh my god. And so on Giacobelli's outlap and pre-qualifying, the engine cover flew off and was dead. Yeah! <laughs> Good! Good! I believe there's actually pictures of the car running without the engine cover. I'll have to find Good. out this. Um, seeing really as this was life, though, they only had one engine cover, so the lack of a replacement lit that life would not set a lap time with the new engine. <laughs> so <laughs> that was it for them in, in Portugal. Um, Jerez was the site of the Spanish Grand Prix, and the change to Judd engines seemingly had no effect on the L190's performance or reliability as Giacomelli completed just two laps <laughs> in pre-qualifying before stopping on track with the fastest time of 1 minute 42.699 seconds, 20 seconds slower than Yannick Dalmas' AGS, and 17 seconds slower than Claudio Lange's in the Eurobrun. With their 14th failure to pre-qualify, it was staggeringly clear that the former first chassis was as hopeless as Lamberto Leone and Richard Davila thought it was. The Life L190 was never closer than 12 seconds to pre-qualifying in 14 appearances, 
and the team wisely made the decision to skip the final two rounds in Japan and Australia and promptly shut down. Wow. And that would be it for the Life F1. Sheesh. <laughs> wow. That's tough. Yep. That's, That's tough. tough. That's as bad as it gets. There's been glimpses as... of success, at least in, in these two previous teams that we've looked at, but uh, there's literally just nothing here. There was no hope. None. Yeah. None. Yeah. Coloni and Eurobrun at least made a race. So. Yeah. Wow. So, like, yeah. I knew, like, obviously everyone has heard of this, and I knew it was bad. That, that is, that is utterly miserable. That is hopeless. Yep. I wouldn't even want to do that. <laughs> Oh my god! <laughs> yeah. Bruno Giacomelli came out of basically F1 retirement for that. So, <laughs> oh, I hope he got paid well. Uh, so. Yeah, he better have. God dang. Uh, Sorry. Yeah, Giacomelli would fully retire from racing at the end of 1990 um, with him stepping out of the car when it had the engine failure being the last time he ever stepped out of an F1 car. And his stint at F or in life moved him from forgotten midfielder to driver of the worst F1 car of all time in F1 history. <laughs> You could also give him the title of the guy who had his engine cover fly off. <laughs> yeah! Yeah, that's what I like. Um, the the two appearances Gary Brabham made would be his only F1 attempts in his career, and he would actually end up spending more time in prison than in seat of an F1 car. So, um, But we won't talk about that. <laughs> uh, first, never made another attempt at F1, instead sticking with F3000 for 89. Uh, Marco Apicello would continue to come agonizingly close to winning for them before making his one appearance at Monza in 93 en route to owning the record for shortest F1 career of all time. Uh, first would also employ pay driver Jean-Denis Delatraz for three years before vaulting the Frenchman to a one-off appearance for LaRousse in 94 and two infamous appearances for Pacific at the end of 95. Um, first would then shut down, I believe, after 1991, as far as I can tell. Ernesto Vita appears to have slipped back into obscurity, as I haven't been able to find any more info on him outside his team's legendary 14 Grand Prix appearances. And the Life L190 would disappear until 2009, when the chassis and engine were restored to run at the Goodwood Festival of Speed. Um, there's a couple quotes about the car that I don't know if they were made at the Goodwood Festival of Speed. One of them was made, I believe, by Nigel Roebuck, where he said that his favorite engine of all time is the the life w12 which he quoted as saying it sounded like a trash can full of nuts and bolts tumbling down a staircase <laughs> um, and i believe gary brabham was the one who said or maybe it's bruno giacomelli it was one of the two drivers said that while he was driving he suspected or he heard the engine making a weird noise and that it was he suspected that all the cylinders were working <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. You gotta be kidding me, dude. That's awesome. That's amazing. Um, That's so good. But you might be thinking, wow, life has got to be the worst team of all time. And you're probably right. But there is one other team that gives them a run for their money. Uh, next time on Disqualified, we take a look at another team that was uh, that bought an abandoned F1 chassis as the basis of their own F1 vanity project, also from Italy, named Andrea Oda. Yeah, yes, that'll sir. be for next time. And that yes, was sir. the story of life. That's terrific. So. That is just. I remember being I... a young lad perusing through Wikipedia, discovering, stumbling, if you will, upon the Life <laughs> F1 page. And Much I thought, like how life stumbled across their entire it existence. It was it was my perspective at the time that all F1 teams have always been good and high quality and. You know, so I, I was floored at how bad this team could be, and I felt bad for them. And now that I know the story, it's like, I'm, I'm still, I feel bad for them, I guess. But they also didn't really even try. I don't, I, yeah. well, it's hard, you know. I don't know. But, yeah. but God damn it, I'm glad they did because they are legendary. It's in a their great own way. story. Yeah. it is a great story. That, that is, the, that. I mean, this is, that's like the point of this whole podcast. I don't want to get like too. Oh, like that is the whole point is like racing is full of just the best stories and while this is like utterly depressing it's a good ass story it's hilarious too because it's just like literally everything on the wall it was written on the wall is like this is never gonna work because you had a chassis that one team already was like we're not <laughs> racing this this is deadly 
And then you have an engine design that never got built because Ferrari, who loved their crazy giant engines, was like, this is stupid. Why would we build this? <laughs> and then you bash them together. And of course, it didn't work out. And you had F1 <laughs> and you had drivers turning down an F1 seat that would not race it. <laughs> yeah. And and not only did it not work out, it didn't work out over and over and over again. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and they didn't really think to change all that much. It, amazing, it was too late. Yeah, it's amazing that the W12 lasted 12 races because after like race two, it was like, I don't think this is going to work. <laughs> <laughs> like, it was like the definition of insanity, man. They just kept trying the same thing yeah. over and over again. They didn't get a single different result. So, that's any good other, stuff. Any other closing thoughts, you guys? It's just awesome. I think one of the things that I can take away from this a little bit is like, uh, I mentioned earlier in the sort of the Formula SE sphere, like, I realize how close what we're doing is kind of to F1 on a completely <laughs> different scale, sure. But yeah, I mean, yeah. with the carbon fiber chassis, like, we go through the same things they do where we have to pass crash testing and that kind of thing. Um, and, you know, there are things we don't pass, so we have to fix and patch or whatever. And sometimes the um carbon fiber cures don't go perfectly so we have to inject micro balloons in there and, and stuff like that and uh there was a team i believe it was either the early 2000s or late 90s and i don't remember when i forget who the team was but they tried to build their very own v8 engine from scratch and oh it gosh. was a terrible fa failure <clears throat> um there's also a, a, a rule in fse there's a limit on displacement size i think it's like I don't know what it is off the top of my head, but um, so basically they had to build a small displacement V8 and it was a horrible failure that produced like five <laughs> horsepower on the dyno <laughs> and that's terrific and I'm all about that. And this is, this is, this kind of lines up with that a little bit and, and, I, and I love it. No, absolutely. I, I agree. It, it's, you know, on top of what I said about how racing, in my opinion, is about the stories, um, it's just as much about those guys that are making those decisions and doing things like that. Obviously... You know, while these mechanics maybe didn't have the empowerment or the or the status to say, "Hey, we should run a Judd after like the first two absolute failures," but like uh, they were still putting the effort in, they're still showing up and doing it, and like that is just like that's racing. That at the end of the day, no matter what, as bad as it went, that's racing. I I, I love that about it. That's what I love about this show is learning about these people who really put it all on the line and they horribly failed. But they really, they really tried something. They really tried to make something happen. And I, I, again, it just comes back to it's just a good story. Yep. Also, shout out to the mechanics who went on strike and didn't put any oil in the engine and grenaded it. <laughs> Honestly, the best part. That was yeah. my favorite part so far. That and the engine that, cover flying off. Total anarchy. Engine cover flying off. That's, I mean, that the, listen. If we have, if we have a podcast that doesn't have an engine cover off story, I, I don't know what yeah. we're going to do. I mean, they were just ahead of the time with our movement of abolishing airboxes. So who knows? They they didn't really get to run the car with the with the yeah. cover yeah, off. Yeah, they, they were onto something. For might sure. have been 14 seconds a lap without it. it could have been. We'll never know. It so, could have been. Thanks, FIA. <laughs> <laughs> Taking that away from us. Yeah. So this has been disqualified though on JTN. Thanks for watching. JTN two. Uh oh, JTN two. Yes, correct. Um, you guys want to plug anything before we go? Make sure to listen to the Fake Racers podcast. Uh, make Thank sure you. to tune in to the JTN broadcasts. Please go check out the JTN merch if you'd like. Obviously, the best way to support us is to subscribe and follow us on all the social media channels. Get yourself a Tommy's World shirt. Um, all Get that fun stuff. While you're at it, you if go. you have, but 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 like I was saying, the best way to support us is, is subscribing and following on all of our social media channels and, and areas and all that stuff. But if you want to go that little extra step further, the JTN merch is fantastic. It's high quality. Um, I, I got if you're if you're a regular of the Fake Racers podcast, I got my mug. <laughs> I got my mug. I'll. Uh, it's on display here. Yeah. It's very representative I, uh, of the Life F1 team. Hold well. mine by the handle. I got the Life F1 mug. <laughs> 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 the handle, the handle flew, off. flew off during pre qualifying. <laughs> yeah, I got the I got the Life F1 mug. Got a um, JTN cup. If <laughs> it, it, unfortunately, this is a shipping error. But yeah. at the end of the day, it's a good quality mug. I'm ashamed I don't have a handle. To be honest, it's just shedding but, weight to make it more aerodynamic. That's what I'm saying. See that? Yeah. Just about See a that See, mine, mine, is, mine is the W12, and yours is the version with the Judd where it mm -hmm. shed like like 170 pounds. So. That's. 
Matt, you made me feel so good about my cup. that might be correct. I don't know, but... Uh... Yeah. It could be. Yep. All so. right. I don't have anything to plug well, other than subscribing to JTN because we're getting really close to a thousand subs over there. And you know what that means? It's... Uh, oh, my God. It's 2003 <laughs> time, so... <laughs> oh, my God. There's nothing so. I plug that Davey's not like, oh, my God, too, so... <laughs> You're right, <laughs> unfortunately. Uh. True. <laughs> So once again, thanks for listening, everybody. This has been disqualified. Uh, hopefully, the next episode doesn't take nearly as long to come out. But I happy hope F1 it was season, late. everyone! Happy, happy F1, F1 season. season! Oh yeah, recording this the night after the F1 race. Yeah, awesome. Mm-hmm. So, and uh, we'll see you next time. Thanks for watching. Bye. Bye. See ya.